History, it's often said, is written by the victors. In the case of the Pentridge Revolution, the victors wrote the history, and the shame and fear felt by the defeated silenced those who had another tale to tell. Several generations were to pass before real questions were asked about the history of this strange and tragic uprising. Two hundred years after the Pentridge revolutionaries tried and failed to bring about radical change in the life of the country and with it in their own lives, there is general agreement about the outline of what happened. The question of why it happened is, as ever, more contentious. Arguments continue to rage about such issues as the role of Oliver the Spy and why George Waitman's sentence was commuted from execution to transportation. These interests are not just debated by historians, they are of enduring interest to the descendants of the people at that time, revolutionaries and non-revolutionaries alike. The key question never changes. What does this mean for us and our own times? Even by contemporary standards, the lives of the poor in the Regency period were harsh, brief and often brutal. Employment was ill-rewarded and often temporary. Average life expectancy was 45. 40% 40 of the children didn't live to see their fifth birthday. Yet society had treated the poor this way since time immemorial. So why did the revolt happen in 1817? And why Pentridge? In the early 1800s, the British authorities feared that the country was on the brink of revolution. To a frightened government, the conditions seem ripe. An economic depression, the loss of jobs through mechanisation, poor harvests, the country filled with unemployed soldiers, and a recent example of a successful revolution just across the Channel. Discontent rose and found a focus in the Luddite movement, which began in Nottingham in 1811. Most of the politicians who are in office during the period of the Pentridge Rebellion are, are contemporaries. They've gone through that French Revolution. Some of them actually witnessed events in Paris. So the authorities are obsessed with the idea that normal people would come out and actually start a revolution themselves. I think for the rebels themselves, uh, certainly the ideas of the revolution are still extremely strong particularly Thomas Paine, who wrote The Rights of Man, uh, and Thomas Bacon, who's the local Pentridge radical, who goes right back to the time of the French Revolution. He'd been campaigning to make those ideas a reality for the best part of his adult life. What we also notice is there's some sort of interlinking with Luddism. The personnel, the contacts built up, very similar indeed. So, for example, Stevens, the leader of the committee in Nottingham, he's a Luddite. Brandreth, he's a Luddite. In fact, Thomas Bacon, the magistrate's reports say that he was the leading Luddite in Pentridge and Swanwick. It's very clear to me there is an interconnection here between Pentridge uh, and also Nottingham in terms of the Luddite connection. Though the harsh reaction of the authorities had by 1816 largely suppressed the movement, other factors meant that the threat of an uprising or even revolution persisted. England had a tradition of political radicalism combined with a readiness to riot which was noted by many commentators. The country was also comparatively literate Around 60% of men and 40% of women could read. Radical pamphlets calling for reform or revolution were widely read. There was also encouragement from some religious leaders. Though the Church of England hierarchy preached that God ordained the rich man in his castle and the poor man at his gate, some ministers sympathised with the poor and their efforts to change their lot. The Reverend Hugh Wollstonehome curate of St Matthew's in Pentridge, was clearly a sympathiser. 
and many of the rebels were Methodists, including Ludlam, who was a lay preacher. I cannot believe that Wollstonehome, who played such an important part in nursing the revolutionaries, the curate, I can't believe that he was appointed without ducal approval and I would hope to find something both about his appointment and about his removal. Yet general discontent and conditions favourable to radical actions and mass uprisings doesn't explain why Pentrich and surrounding villages should be the site of an attempted revolution. Which begs the question of the Nottingham connection. The Pentridge Revolution was not born in isolation and the revolutionaries thought of themselves as part of a much wider movement. One of the centres of that wider movement was Nottingham. In the early 1800s, Nottingham was possibly the most radical town in Britain, a place which the local paper wearily described as continuously the scene of some revolutionary tumult or other. Um, and by, definitely by the period of 1817, you had a depression, you had um, people who were uh, expressing their discontent, first of all as Luddites, um, uh, attacking machines, by the growth, more importantly in the long term, of the Framework Knitters Union, and involvement in the political reform activity, which we see in the Hampton Clubs. The rebels and the radicals more generally realise that if they've got any chance of affecting a nationwide revolution, they have to secure Nottingham strategically. But however radical a city may be, and however ripe for revolution the times may seem, ultimately the actions of individual players make a vital difference. It is impossible to tell the story or to analyse what happened without considering the roles of Thomas Bacon and Jeremiah Brandreth. Bacon had been planning a local insurrection for many years and seemed the one likely to lead the revolution. Brandreth actually did. Yet, whatever effect the actions of Bacon and Brandreth had on the course of the Rising, it is arguable that the provocations of Oliver the Spy played a far more crucial role in determining events. Is it fair to say Without him, it would never have happened. I think the, uh, the, there was an element of the setup, and crucially, what it was is that Sidmouth wanted a show trial. A show trial based on high treason. The fact that actually there had been robberies, there might have been abductions, there's an allegation of murder, just sweep them under the carpet because the only thing they want is high treason. I think something would have happened. Uh, I mean, clearly the difference that Oliver makes is he's exaggerating the scale of the potential rebel turnout. And obviously he's making it much more likely that the rebellion is going to fail because the authorities are fully apprised. So it's really difficult, but without Oliver, it's very likely something would have happened. Uh, but of course, it's impossible to know quite in what format it would have it seems clear the authorities were willing to risk encouraging a minor uprising, which they could quell easily. That said, it might be asked if they were playing with fire by risking a rising so close to such a radical hotbed as Nottingham. The attempted revolution was crushed. And while the repression and executions largely stamped out radicalism in the Pentridge area, and may have given the radicals in Nottingham and the East Midlands pause, the demand for reform continued and even strengthened. In consequence, the authorities remained wary and ready to use force and spies, notably when the Cato Street conspiracy was suppressed in 1820. The feeling for reform and the fight for militant activity for reform did continue by one year after the rebellion, troops had been garrisoned in Nottingham, um, fearing another, uh, another uprising. And by 1818, 1819, there were strikes and a meeting in, I recently discovered, in 1819, only 18 months after the trial and the executions, um, involving a Nottingham man um, who was executed in Derby, Jeremiah Brandreth, um, you had a meeting of 5,000 people demanding reform 
demanding universal suffrage, demanding all the things which the Hampton Clubs and the Pentridge Rebels had wanted. This fear, which sometimes bordered on paranoia, led in due course to the Peterloo Massacre in 1819. Peterloo was remembered when Pentridge was forgotten or not mentioned. Both were part of a radical tide which could not be stemmed. In 1832 the Reform Act passed and the citizens of Nottingham lived up to their reputation and burned down Nottingham Castle. I think in regard of Peterloo you had thousands of people who were not intending they might have had radical views or reformist views, some of them, but they're not attending to cause any violence, but the violence came from authority, and I think that really upset a lot of people, including people in, in Parliament. You had this period whereby the, and I think even Samuel Bamford made the comment in his book later on, is that, is that the Whigs lost interest in running the country, and the Tories were in power for this period, and they were pretty specific, specific in what they wanted to do, what they were bothered about, and it wasn't caring for the people. And that sort of changed things around a little. Um, in regarding Pentridge, well, that was people who, in some people's eyes, were going armed to uh, cause rebellion. I think it's, that's a different starting point than the one at uh, Peterloo. But before reform came repression in the aftermath of the Pentridge Revolution. Executions, imprisonments, and transportation to the penal colonies in Australia scattered men and women from Pentridge across the country and across the world. Many families were torn apart forever, never to see their menfolk again. For many years, a family tie to one of the revolutionaries was a mark of shame in Pentridge and the surrounding villages. But it also travelled with the exiles. The grave I'm standing next to is uh, six of Isaac Ludlum's children. Uh, I've been researching now for about 17 years and uh, one of the children on here is one that I hadn't found so uh, it is obviously not on records but is, is, is actually on the gravestone here. There's about 130 families that took part all together and up to yet I've got about 70 of them. Uh, so I've still got a long way to go but I've got the main ringleaders if you like, the main people that took part in the, in the revolution. My great, 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 great grandfather was involved in the revolution. He was uh, one of the first farms that they called at and I believe he went with them as far as Nottingham. Um, some say that he was uh, imprisoned in there but I, I don't know any other details than that. He was also very near to the place where the Turners, who graves here, um, lived. His farm wasn't far from there and they owned the quarry in Wingfield Park where the pikes were held and anybody who's read anything about the Pentry Revolution will know that it was a hub of where at least two of the people there were hung and beheaded for treason. For many of those transported, Australia was a new start. Attitudes towards the revolutionaries mellowed far more quickly than in Britain, particularly for those who proved to be honest and diligent workers. When George Waitman died, he was honoured as a victim of British injustice. We're very pleased and honoured that you'll be able to attend this event today. What uh, do you know about Jeremiah Brandreth? Dale, can I ask you first, what do you know about Jeremiah? Well, I've known for quite a few years that he was involved in a revolution. But I didn't know all the facts and the family was a bit skittish about publicising the fact that he was beheaded because they thought that must be he's very bad for something. The passage of time eventually changed reactions in Britain and elsewhere. Many now take pride in what their ancestors tried to do. The debate will continue because there is never a final right answer and research has been gathering pace rather than tailing off. So for 10 years he was writing it, doing lots of research at the Home Office Records, Public Records Office, being in touch with uh, Fred Waitman and John Turner in particular in Australia. Who were yes, yes, who were descendants. In fact, Fred Waitman came and stayed with us at our house for a couple of weeks. I remember when I was, you know, when I was a girl. And Dad went to Australia and in the 80s and met some of the descendants. 
History is written by the victors, but time gives perspective and we look again, sense the echoes of our own time and rewrite that history, just as later generations will rewrite ours. The bravery, I think, is the bravery of these people who stood up when they decided enough was enough. And it was, you know, people um, starting to fight for, for their democratic rights, but also about how they were being treated as industries changed and moved. And it's just so important to remember the struggles that people have fought before us to get the things that we're able to benefit from today. Without these so-called martyrs, Pentridge martyrs and other places like the Tollpuddle martyrs, we would not be further along the road. We would have to have travelled much further along the road to get the democracy and the freedoms we have now. That's my connection with my ancestors and all of his fellow sufferers. They grab it all and leave us naught. Their riches by our hunger bought. The time has come, you plainly see. The government's opposed must be. And every man is skilled. Deny. No bloody soldier must be dread. He must turn out and fight for bread. The time has come, you plainly see. The government opposed must be. The time has come, you plainly see. The government's opposed.